Ah, loving Father, thank you for every hungry heart that is gathered together tonight. Lord, we gather around your presence and we celebrate your presence, but we ask you to come in increasing glory and transforming power tonight. We just acknowledge that we have a deep and eternal need for you to come and be among us. And so, Father, come and have your way. Just surrender your heart to him. Say, here I am, Lord, come. I, I give it all to you right now. In the mighty name of Jesus. Yeah, lean over and give somebody a hug. Say, you're glad to see them. You're glad they came. And let's worship the Lord, shall we? All right, go ahead, Jonathan. Voice will lift you high with 
We're here to worship you, here to give you praise, here to give you praise. We've come to meet with you tonight.
broken heart mended and mind reinvented whatever you breathe on is coming alive god you restore us the glory before us whatever you love on is coming alive and everything
Yes, we can. 
his love through the storm. seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging face in every high and stormy
Death, where is your sting? I resurrect again. 
sing hallelujah for the Lamb has overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. Oh, the Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing Celebrate it with us, everybody. We sing hallelujah. Forever, forever. no king like you there is no savior like you not even close Lord you came you lived you died you took our sin and shame and opened the way forever for us to be reunited with the father of love oh lift your hands and thank him people Jesus, we thank Lord, you. Lord, may we never we forget. We love you, Lord. Ah, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you, Lord. Ah, there is no king like you, Jesus. Wow. Ah, it's your glory. Come. Wow. Well, Let your resurrected you, life descend upon us in this yes, place. Yes, Lord. Lord, we give this whole week to you. Wow. Be glorified in our midst. Yes, Lord. Have your mighty way. Wow. Bring your fiery love and burn it deep within us. Thank you, Lord. Cause us to be even more like you. In your mighty name we pray. Wow, Carol. I know. It's good, isn't uh, it? It's fantastic. Will you turn and smile at somebody and Tell them it's going to be okay. Because Jesus is alive. I mean, that changes everything, doesn't it? Oh, goodness sakes. John, I just felt when we were worshiping, like it's just amazing because the, his glory and his presence was so here right from the beginning. Like this is the first night of the conference and usually you ramp up, but... It's just like we've come into another level already. We've stepped up. Uh, so all of you pastors and leaders and, and that are here, um, I just want you to just stand up just for a minute. Wow. Can you just stand? Uh, wow. You've been all busy. You've been all traveling. You've been all coming. Uh, but I just felt the Lord say, just step one little step back into his arms 
and just leave all the cares. Wow. Just let them go. Ah. Say, Lord, I'll leave them at your cross tonight. But Lord, this week, I'm going to focus my eyes on you. Because we are in another season in another level. Wow. And so, Lord, I just lift off everything that everyone has come in with. All the excess baggage that's not of you, Lord. We just lift it off right now. Ah! And just take a big, deep breath of him. Wow. Again. Wow. Yeah. Whoa, that should be feeling better. Well, because it's getting thick up here. <laughs> Whoa. Ah. Okay, bless you. You can sit down. Uh, but if you're getting heavy again, Wait a you minute. pick before it up. You, before you sit down, before you sit down, stretch okay. your hands up, up towards us here and say, fire on you, Carol. She caught it, Doug. She did. Oh, come on, do it again. <laughs> yeah. Put some on Duncan as well while you're at it. Oh, oh yay. Please don't forget to have fun, will you? You know, it's, it's not just all serious stuff where we have to meditate on, you know, the heavy, wonderful truths of the Bible, but the joy of the Lord is our strength. Can you remember that? Remember the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, and a whole bunch of other things. But get the love, joy, peace part for sure, and you keep going all the way down to self-control and, uh, you know, self-control is a wonderful, wonderful gift. Did you know that? that? That's a gift for you to control yourself. That's never meant for you to control the Holy Spirit. Just saying, you know. Because he may want to do some stuff with you, in you, to you, through you, that is completely outside of the box and over the top for you, but it'd be a good thing if he's the one doing it, right? So why don't you tell him, Holy Spirit, whatever you want to do with me this week, it's okay with me. Ah. Wow. Smile at somebody, please. And, uh, you know, let's just <laughs> smile at somebody, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I want you to, to just feel really welcome here in our house tonight. How many have never been here before? Just give me a wave. Never been here. Eric, you've never been here before. Well, welcome, friends. You know, it's amazing how it's, uh, it's held consistently true for about 23 years. This is actually our 23rd anniversary of Revival coming up. And uh, just, just every time I ask that question, there's about one-third of the people who've never been here before. And uh, so that's good. It just keeps fresh wood coming in for the fire, you know. And so uh, look out. There's a lot of burning embers and coals and everything all around you. And the one thing we love about the Holy Spirit is he's so contagious. <sighs> So tell your friend, you're going to get it this week. You're going to get it. Well, I just got back from uh, a wonderful trip to Kenya. It was there two weeks. We did a leader school in, in a city called Burra, uh, toward the south, more to the Tanzanian border. And then we went back up to a place called Kakamega, where Stu and Chloe have their mission, and uh, 
we, that's where our, one of our main garden trainers lives. And we had just a wonderful time up there with hungry, hungry people. How many have been to Kenya? Let's see. Numbers of you had. And uh, what I love about it is uh, a shocking reality, and that is everybody you talk to is a believer in Jesus. Now, I'm sure not every single one, but everyone you talk to, at least that I talk to, believes in the Lord Jesus. It's amazing. Totally amazing. And I'm trying to imagine what Canada would be like if, if everyone you talk to, the airline hostesses, the policemen that are coming to the meeting to protect you from terrorists and stuff. So I guess there's some terrorists there that probably aren't saved. But, uh, <laughs> but that kind of stuff, it was just everywhere. And uh, Angel, down here somewhere, where are you? Where are you, Angel? When we were in Mexico a month ago, she told me about these SD cards that you could get that have uh, all kinds of information on them in the language of the people. And so she arranged with some friends for me to get 500 of these SD cards, and it had the Jesus film in Swahili, and a Swahili Bible, and then the audio Bible where it'll read to you, and some other stuff. And I'm telling you what a hit those things were. They absolutely love them. And uh, they just stick that in their little phones and had all that right available. And uh, the, the resourcing that goes on for the, for the price of a little SD card, I mean, they gave them to me. I think maybe I'm supposed to pay for them. I don't know. They were about $4 <laughs> each. <laughs> anyway, they loved them. And what a way to evangelize. You don't have to smuggle Bibles anymore. You just take a bag full of SD cards and, and go around the world, give the gospel away. Because they love it in their own language. And so... We, we had an absolute wonderful time in Kenya with Charlie and, and Elaine Passy. And is anybody here from Catch the Fire Halifax? Any Maritimers here? I know Danny is here from uh, Moncton, New Brunswick, so they, they know who I'm talking about. But anyway, it was fantastic, except Carol wasn't with me to see the elephants and the lions and all the stuff, you know. Uh, yeah. Anyway, is it ever good to be home? My goodness. Yeah. <sighs> Canada is such a wonderful country. Did you know that? You, know? you get free medical care here, just in case your prayer doesn't work, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> but um, just special thanks to all our world changers that enable Carol and I and many, many others to, to go to a lot of countries that absolutely couldn't afford to have us come but we're able to go because of people like you, and we're really, really thankful for that. So, hey, we've got quite a lineup of speakers for you. Eric Johnson is here. Just stand up, give us a wave, Eric. We'll be introducing him in a moment. And uh, Duncan Smith, you've met already. He's uh, up here with Carol. He'll be speaking. Steve Long's gonna be speaking to us. Heidi's on her way. And uh, I'm not sure who else is speaking in MSync. Are they speaking? No. Stu and Chloe are speaking. Stand up, guys. In fact, why don't you run up here and tell us what's going on in London. And uh, they have an amazing mission in Kenya as well with uh, a children's, children's homes and villages they're doing and all kinds of stuff. But you know what? The world is being one to Christ. Are you aware of that? They're just Christians taking over everything. It's fantastic, isn't it? And we want it here as well, and England too. Come on. Hello. Hello. It's <laughs> a little giggle. Hello. It's so amazing to be back. It's only like, what, four months since we were here? But it's just so incredible to be back with family. And um, <laughs> we're having a wild time in London. It's just things seem to be kind of <sighs> exploding. You know, the feeling where you just think, ah! You're out of control and we're having so much fun. We've had recently, just on Sunday even, we had five salvations. A Hindu and a Muslim came to the meeting. One of our friends, two of their friends came and they felt the power of the Holy Spirit and they're like, oh, this is a little bit freaky and then just submitted and said, you know what, this is Jesus, gave their lives to Jesus. 
and Sunday we had another five, one outside the church, after church. And so God's doing something. And when the moment we declared, God, we just need evangelists raised up. We're committing to see the the lost loved back to you and the prodigals return. We're going to get outside of the church. And all of a sudden, all these evangelists have started popping up inside of Catch a Fire London and are just going for it with healing on the streets and going into the government and helping with the government. And so we're really pumped and excited. So you know what? If you don't have evangelists in your church, just start calling them in. Just pray for sons and daughters to raise up and actually be just, you know, solid, grounded lovers of Jesus that want to win the loss. So we're really pumped for what's happening. And um, yeah, you're going to add some stuff about Kenya? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Go on. I was just going to say the other, that we've, we, we literally spoke out a couple of things last year. And there's a lot of work that's gone in behind this, but when the leadership spoke out a few things, doors started to really open. Um, one was with evangelism, one was with our local community. Um, some of the work that's going on there now has just been absolutely incredible. We had 100 people out on the streets um, just doing litter picking and befriending and IT help and baking cakes. And we had the three local councillors joining us in serving the local community. So I just really want to recommend that you just speak stuff out. Um, we spoke out about o- open doors into government, that, um, that God really wants us to start to have an influence within the government of the UK, and some of the open doors there have been absolutely incredible, um, just partnering with other organizations and people who are doing stuff, but just seeing random invitations. Chloe and I got invited to Downing Street last year, and um, it's just amazing watching the power of the tongue actually happen um, when, you, when you choose to agree with what God has said and speak it out. Um, and yeah, in Kenya, we've just, com- well, we're just in the process. We've done 19 acres. We're completing another two acres. Um, and we're building a village. And all the stuff's been bought for the first building. Um, and so we'll be building that. Literally, it should start tomorrow, the building, because yeah. all the stuff's now been bought. And so we're building a village for vulnerable children in Western Kenya. Um, and yeah, things are just too many opportunities. Um, not enough hands, but it is absolutely amazing. And we just heard from our missionaries in Kenya that the total last year was 700 widows gave their lives to Jesus. And so we're like, what? You know, God's on the move and we're really excited. We've got a mission trip coming up on the 20th of March. So if you want to come to Kenya for 10 days and then I think Catch a Fire Canada, Toronto mission trip is coming up in October. So it's going to be an exciting year. That would be amazing. How many would like to go with them? Have some fun over there. Steve, you're going, aren't you? Oh, you're in October. Is that when it is? All right. Kenya in October. Anybody? Are you going to do a safari? How many want to go on a safari? Oh, we got a bunch more now. All right. Three days. Fantastic. Yeah, we went on a safari, too, for one day. Saw all kinds of lions. I've never seen a lion eating a fresh kill before. (laughs) So that was interesting. (laughs) We were close enough to hear all these bones crunching and all kinds of stuff. And you missed it. I mean, it was incredible. But actually, the, when we went up to the north, where or I think it's north or the west part, at least, where, uh, where these guys are, not far from Lake Victoria, uh, is, is where we have a high concentration of our harvest gardens. And it, and it was so thrilling for me to see how they have impacted the communities that are actually working them, because it, it gave them hope, you know, that they're able to grow enough food and have a bit of profit left over and, and work in these very, very <coughs> nutritious gardens and the health and oh, just a whole lot of benefit that comes, comes along with it. I think we've got like a hundred of them or something now in Africa. These are quarter acre gardens that, that feed lots and lots of people good nutritious food. But what got me was how it changed the, the heart and, and the and the mindset of, of the people there that just gave them hope and they're all getting entrepreneurial. One kid's raising rabbits that pays his way through his school. 
Another guy was raising pigeons and he'd sell the pigeons to pay for his school. And all that because hope was just engendered in their heart. You know, hope is a wonderful thing, friends. Just tell somebody, you know, be filled with hope. Faith, hope, love, you remember? And uh, it's not just love, it's faith and hope. And when you get hope in you, that is giving you faith to go forward in the future. And we just watch the impact of that on, on so, so many people. And, and the, the one garden in particular had about 12, like 12 widows that were, um, you know, working in these things and giving them a bit of an income, giving them some hope and all of that. And they, they were just doing well. They want to do, do some of these beds at their home where they live and everything else. And it, and it amazed me. I came away thinking, I really want to help these widows, these women, get on with it and, and develop it even more. And get this, two of the widows were widowed because their husband died. The one, the one man was married to the two women. And um, it's not uncommon over there to have more than one wife, unfortunately. How, you know, and it's just like a, a what kind of culture? Like, but but that, that's the reality. And, and so here they were, the two, the two widows from the same man working in the same community garden. So I thought, God, you're amazing. You really, really are amazing. Wow. Well, let's see. Um, I was going to ask this lady from France. I think your name is Chantel. Where, where are you, my dear? Can you come on up just for a minute? And um, uh, Terry, Terry uh, Caron, where, where are you, Terry? Terry Caron, where are you? Run up here, too. I may need your, your help to translate. Yeah, but let's have Terry come. Give David a rest. Yeah. Uh, she was just telling me that we were in Brittany, France, at the end of November, 1st of December. We had a wonderful school with you, right? Oh, you were at the October one, not the later one. Okay. The first it was in October, and after it was at the end of uh, November. Okay, so you came to both of those events that we did in Brittany. And just tell us about your healing real quick, can you? Okay. Um, the first... Uh... Tell us in French and uh, Terry can translate. Oh. <laughs> um, voilà. Je suis... Ok. Euh, je suis allée à, à Landerneau parce que je fais partie de l'association de Bourg Esplendi qui est en Bretagne. What did she say, David? <laughs> I'm part of a community called um, the Bourg Esplendi. Get up, rise up and shine. All right, go ahead. And um, uh, when I, I was, I was with my husband, and um, I You're am ill. Oh, no, sorry. She's doing it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> She's doing it. 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 She's <laughs> oh my God! David, come on. <laughs> Take Terry's mic. <laughs> so, okay. I am Lyster. <laughs> what? <laughs> See, that, that's what happens. You get up on this platform, you go all fuzzy, you know, like... The French guy can't understand French up here, you know. All right. What did she say, David? So, uh, maybe you better go to, back to English. Come on, Chantel. I, I had a disease, the Lyme disease. Lyme disease. She had Lyme disease, all right. And I come to see after, uh, because uh, John said, uh, everybody who wants, I could pray for you. So a lot of people go, so I stay in my chair. And my side, go, no. In my side, second time, go. So I go, and I know it's you. <laughs> and you, um, you pray on my head, and I realize that. And every people go in the other side, and I, I stay, do nothing. 
And after, in my heart, to be like that, you know? And I do that. And he put his hand more, more. Okay. During a long time. And after, I, I, I wrote to my share like that, you know? What happens? What happens? And after a long time, I want to come in back, but you know, just besides, say, oh, thank you. And one moment, he see me, <laughs> so I can move. And um, the day after, it was better. <laughs> so, if you caught that, it was going back and forth, English, French. But we put hands on her head, and then she felt the f, which is fire. And uh, then the day after, <laughs> you felt much better. Yes. How long did you have Lyme's disease? Um, it was a long period because I have to see a lot of doctors before one doctor see what is it. Because my, my first doctor, a second doctor, doesn't know what, what happens. Because I have a lot of... So the doctors didn't know what it was. How long were you sick? <sighs> one year and a half. One and a half years. And one moment, one moment, I can't why myself. It's my husband who washed me. You know? So I, I could wash my body. No. You were so weak you could not even wash. Wow. I know I am a bee. And uh, I, I want to be sure that I am okay. So um, we live in the country and we have a fields and a man comes to cut the trees, okay? And after, um, you know, it's like that. And we lost both our translators. <laughs> <laughs> and we have to cut. So one morning, I say to my husband, I want to know if I am okay. If I am okay, I could make the same job than you. So he said, well, yes, if I am not ill, if I am okay, I could do that. So we take the, um, everything is necessary to go in the field. And he put, you know, morceau de bois, piece of wood, and he said to me how to do. I, don't, I say, put more. He put more. After, put more, you know, like that. So, yes, if God is with me, I could. The first time, not, but the second time, yes. And after he turned, and I could do everything, you know. This is God. This is not me. How many, how many understand what she's saying? Yeah, I think you got the idea. She's healed, but her husband was cutting firewood, cutting a tree down and splitting the wood. And she said, if I'm healed, I should be able to split it as well. And so she's got all this strength to split the wood and everything. So it was a mighty heal. Anybody here suffer from Lyme's disease? Anyone? What's that? Well, if you're online, you have Lyme's disease. Somebody's got their hand up over there. Uh, had it, have it, I'm not sure what you're saying. She had it, but she's better now. <laughs> Another one, very, very good. Yes, exactly. Well, Lord, if you have it, run up here and ministry team, come and gather around them. We're just going to pray for you that what happened to this lady will happen to you. So quickly, come on. Run, run, run. Yeah, maybe you can't run, I don't know. Uh, Come on, ministry team, front row, uh, Trevor, Kate, Sandra, um, Stu, Chloe, Steve, Trish, Patricia. Is there only one? That's good. There's only one with Lyme disease. That's good. Stretch your hand up here towards Chantel and say, plus de feu. <laughs> Plus de feu. Ah, Shaba. In the name of Jesus, Lord, come and fill this precious French lady with your fiery love and your glory that rests mightily upon us in the name of Jesus. 
Amen, my dear. Thank you so much. Give her a big hand right there. She, uh, she's a, a part of a wonderful, charismatic Catholic community over there in France, not too far from you guys, Phil, right there in Brittany. You could have taken a one-hour ferry ride and joined us for all of that. Yeah, no ferries going, he says. But anyway, um, it was just a blessing to see how God just came and, and, and filled all those people. There's hunger all over the place, isn't there? Why don't you lean over to your friend and say, fire on you. Go on, just take a good big drink of the Holy Spirit. Carol, are you helping me with this or, or what? All right, let me make a couple of announcements quick. Um, tomorrow, the doors will open at 9. The, the lobby will open at 8.30. So come on in at 8.30, get a cup of coffee in the coffee shop, and the doors will open at 9 o'clock. Um, no saving of seats overnight, all right? Anything you leave on chairs will be placed in the lost and found. So that's at the end of the night that happens. And all the info that you need is in the conference booklet. Or go ahead and ask the front desk if you have any questions. Let me find out where everybody's from. How many are here from somewhere in Europe? Wave at me. Wave, wave, wave. Stand up and wave. Come on. All you Europeans. God bless you guys. And, uh, you know, just, just curious, but does that include the UK still? Yeah. At the moment. Well done for Brexit, by the way. You know, come on, that's, that globalism is not the kingdom, not the same thing at all. But uh, how many are here from the UK somewhere? Stand up and give us a proper wave. Yeah, come on, there you go. All right, we have at least one lady from France. Are there any others from France? How about Germany? Uh -huh. How about anywhere else in Europe that I didn't mention, like Scandinavia or Iceland? I see Maria is here from Iceland and then friends. Are you from Iceland also? Where? Norway, great, wonderful. Where? Switzerland, very, very good. How about uh, South America? Anybody here from South America? Yes, All right. what country, my dear? Good and loud, relay it up to me, I can't hear her. Colombia, fantastic. Uh, how about uh, the Far East, China, Japan, uh, great, Korea, yes, all right, very, very good, these guys in Korea, and uh, that, uh, young June there from Korea, his entire family has come over here to take our leader's school over the years, he also has taken it, he came back to take it again. I just think that's amazing. How is it the second time? The second time through, better than ever? <laughs> four times, is that what you're saying? You're holding up four, what does that mean? You've taken the school, the leader school, four times. Every time gets better. Did you know that, Gordon and Kathy? The five-month school. Wait a minute. He's taking the five-month school after this? Well, hey, you can't get enough of a good thing, I guess. You know. I was going to make some comment about, well, some people need a little more time, you know, but it's a, no, no, it's, it's all good stuff. Uh, if you're from somewhere else in the world that I didn't call you out, just wave at me and we'll, 
Oh, yeah, I missed half of you. United States. Is there anybody here from the... Congratulations on your new president, by the way. Am, <laughs> Am I allowed to say that without getting stoned or, you know? How about from Canada? Very good. All right. Well, bless your hearts. I, I want you to know that to the best of our ability, we want this to be a safe place for you not only to have good teaching, but to encounter the presence of God in a life-changing way. How many have had their lives revolutionized in this place? Wave excitedly. If you're excited, I mean, you know. Wow, that's so good. And I just said to Carol, you know, babe, we've been doing this for 23 years. And she's like, yeah. <laughs> and, and so it seems like forever and yet, we've only just begun. And God is in the business of changing lives through the Word and the Spirit and supernatural encounters by the Holy Spirit that get right down to the root of the problem is really where we want to go. And that's why we want to pray for people every opportunity we get. So before you go home tonight, uh, even though you've been traveling and it's late and everything. How many are a bit jet lagged besides me? You know, I think Kenya is like nine hours different than here. And uh, yeah, so your body doesn't know what day it is, never mind what time it is. <laughs> but, but don't leave before you get prayer tonight, right? Just dust yourself off from all the cares of life and all the busyness and all the stuff that we think is so important that actually is not all that important compared to the things of the kingdom. Amen? So take a minute, pray for your friend and say, hey, I just lift all that off you, all that busyness, all that cares and all the, all the grunge and all the yuck and all the that and all the everything. We just get it off. And you watching at home, we take it all off of you as well. All the heaviness, all the burdens, all the cares of this life, we lift it off and we remind you that Jesus is alive and everything comes alive in him. So it's so good. Well, listen, let's stand to your feet and let's welcome Eric Johnson as he comes and shares the word with us tonight. Come on, young man. This is his first time here. His dad's been here many, many times. His brother's been here. But this is your first time, so welcome, 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 Eric. God bless you. Over to you. I'll get this out of your way. All right, I'm not sure if I'm going to wait for a sound guy. Okay. Sound guy, give me a heads up what you want from me. Check one. Anyways, hello. We are having some technical difficulties at the moment. So do you want me to switch? No. Talk to your neighbor for a moment. Tell them how beautiful they look right now.
Okay, I'm here. Hello, everyone. All right. Go Toronto, huh? Well, it is an absolute honor to be here. This is, as John said, this is my first time not to Canada, but to Toronto. And uh, it is a tremendous honor to be up on this stage, to be honest with you. This place impacted our world, our family, our church, and me personally for the last 23 years. And when the Holy Spirit broke out here on Father's Day, I was actually just graduated high school. And so I was in a new season of life. And so we got the good old VHS tapes. Anybody remember the VHS tapes? Did anybody still have those? Some, oh my goodness. You might want to hang on to those. Those are um, very valuable. And um, so we were deeply, deeply impacted by what the Lord was doing um, here all those years and still continue to this day. We admire you guys from afar. We love, we just love what God has done with this house and what he continues to do as it's spreading all over the planet. And so um, Ben asked me at lunch today, uh, what, what happened when you got the invitation? I said, I was honored. I mean, I've never been here, let alone to become the speak in a house that has such a rich history that ultimately changed the world and continues to change the world. So I'm humbled, I'm honored to be up here in front of you because I know this room has a lot of people that could stand up here and preach and teach and give what God's given them. So again, I'm really honored to be here. So Johnny Curl, thank you. And uh, love, we love you guys. Every time you come our way, you mess us up real good. And uh, we love it. We love it. We had Carol speak on a Sunday morning, and um, I don't think she enjoyed the fact that we had to end the service. You know, you know Carol. I mean, Carol's like, I, we have three services, and our sanctuary is really small, and we've got, you know, we've got people coming parking lot, and I don't think she enjoyed the fact that we had to end it. You didn't, huh? No, I knew I, it was hard. We're like, oh, so sorry. We're totally quenching something. I know that. So anyway, we still love you and we want you to come back and release more of what you got. So pray for us. We're in the, actually in the early stages, actually a couple years into it, a building project. I was sharing with Duncan earlier on a building project. Hopefully we won't have to have time constraint on our Sunday morning services. And honestly, that's that what we're hoping for. And um, many people don't realize our facility, our campus right now, we have multiple campuses, but our largest meeting room is about 900 people. And we have about 8,000 people that call Bethel their home church. So do the math. It's insane how much, I mean, it's just, it's a lot of church and a lot of, all right, we got to end this one because the parking lot, we have one road coming in and that's it. So, I mean, you, if we go over, if I go over, on Sunday morning by one or two minutes, it creates a 10 to 15 minute additional traffic jam. It's just mayhem. So Carol experienced that pressure from us. Please, I know you want to keep going, but we've got to let everybody go. So anyway, Carol, we love you. We love you. So, all right. It, um, I'm excited to be here. Um, been, I've been preparing for tonight and tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> not wrestling with if anything to say at all. It's more of what to bring, what, what should I bring in the next couple of days for you guys. And so I'm looking forward to sharing my heart with you and what the Lord is doing in our world and where, where he's leading us, where he's taking us. But before I get into any of that, I want to introduce my family. I have a lovely family and I asked, sent some pictures in. This is, uh, this, is, this is very recent. So this is the latest, um, this, capture, this captures us. So, Obviously, the guy is me. Hopefully, he's figured that out by now. Um, the young lady that I'm holding hands with, that's my youngest daughter. Her name is Sayla Mari Johnson, and she is 15. She is a sophomore in high school, and she is on the ski team, and she just had her first race yesterday, and I uh, happened to miss it, but it's okay. I have many more races to come, and uh, she is a lot like her mother, my, my wife on the far left. She is a lot like her, kind of no, kind of got a big drive in life. Sayla got into freshman year in high school, and she pretty much had done all the research in college, met with a counselor, unbeknownst to us. She comes home, and funny enough, within the next few months, my wife started getting all these phone calls from colleges. And she's like, I didn't give anyone my number. Well, Sayla put my, her, my wife's phone number in all the 
submission. So they're all calling. So we're calling about your daughter, Selah. And she's like, what? What's going on here? So she had done all this research. She'd already got her college picked out. She knew what major she wanted to do. I mean, she just got it all sorted out. And uh, she wanted to do business and marketing, which is not a surprise to us. When she was five years old, she came to us and said, I want to make a lot of money. I said, I believe you should too, because you're my retirement plan. I'm going to give you everything I have, and I want my retirement taken care of by you. I didn't say that out loud. I thought it. But Sayla, she was five, and we caught her in the middle of a... And a funny moment, we actually, I was able to pull my phone out, um, or my, I don't remember if we have cameras or phones then. I pulled a, a, some type of camera device out and recorded this rant from a five-year-old. So it's a little bit of a ranting, and she was very frustrated that all of her toys were made in Thailand or China. And she was really upset about it. She's five. And she's really upset. She's like, every toy, she grabbed it, and she was just showing her, it's made in China. It's made in Thailand. Or Thailand, that's what she called it, Thailand. And she was really upset about the fact that all of her stuff was not made in Redding, California. <laughs> she was. I mean, she's five years old. She's like, I'm going to put Redding on the map. I'm going to make stuff, and I'm going to find famous people, and I'm going to have them have it. Because when people, she's five. And she said, because when somebody sees a famous person that has something that I made, they're all going to want to buy it. And she's got it all figured out. I'm all business and marketing. That seemed to make sense to her. So that's my youngest daughter, Selah. She is stunning. She's creative, smart, and witty. She is, she's way wittier than me. So I'm losing all the battles of sarcasm to her. Um, so the next one over, that's my oldest daughter, Kennedy. Kennedy Kate. She is 17. And uh, she's driving, of course, and she is a junior in high school, and she um, is into sports. She's super into sports and playing high school, or obviously school sports. She's on traveling teams and clubs, and she's just really into sports. So we have a couple more years of schooling with her, and then we'll see what's next for her. She loves kids and loves sports, so I'm sure there's going to be a mixture of those two. And then the next wonderful lady is my best, no, not, I'm sorry. I'm going to talk about my wife before we go to that picture. Thank you. My wife, she's my best friend. She's my lover. She's my companion and partner in life. We just celebrated our 19th wedding anniversary a few months ago. Yeah, we, got, we got number 20 coming up, and we've been talking about 20 years since we got together. We're going to do something big on our 20 years. And when we started dating in college, we, and we knew that we were going to spend the rest of our life together, one of our things was we want to grow old together. We want to get gray hair together, and we want to get old together. So you will hear my wife and I talk about how much we like getting older, because we actually, we actually think you get better with age. Three people agree with that. Well, <laughs> Duncan, do you know that we get better with age? We do. Anything that has value is worth a lot because it got older. Nobody, nobody buys, spend lots of money in raisins but people spend a lot of money on wine. Why? Because it gets better with age. And so we really believe that. The Bible is very clear about that. And so we live in a culture, we live in a day and age that emphasizes you need to be younger, you need to be younger. And I'm sure there's a place for it, but really it's, uh, it's actually, I believe it's, a, it's somewhat of a, I don't, don't want to give the devil too much credit, but I do think it's a plan of the enemy to not, to get people to not value getting older. And so if I have anything to add to that conversation, um, I don't know if I'll have gray hair by the time I get that age. I hope I have hair. That's really what I'm praying for. So we'll see. We'll see when that time comes. So anyway, that's my lovely family. The next photo is just a funny one. This is who we are when no one's watching. We love to have fun. That's a few years old, but that's my lovely family. And uh, anyway, I wanted you to meet them at least with the picture. So thanks, guys, for that. Yeah. <clears throat> I want to... I brought some book. I want to get this done tonight, so I don't have to deal with it tonight or tomorrow. Um, I don't remember how long ago, but my dad and I co-wrote a book um, a few years back called Momentum. It's been out, again, I forget how many years, probably five or six years, maybe seven years. And dad wrote four chapters, and I wrote seven. When um, the publisher came to meet with me, there were um, about a couple ideas around the book. My dad was in the meeting, and we were talking about spiritual inheritance. We were talking about inheritance in general, biologically, spiritually, and just inheritance in general. And that was something that um, 
just to give you a little bit of a background, um, I'm sixth generation pastor. So you can imagine on my dad's side, on my mom's side, I'm fourth generation Christian. So you can imagine my upbringing is, I had five options growing up, apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's actually a joke, but no one ever said that. Maybe they thought it, at least they didn't say it. So you can imagine my upbringing was very much in the uh, momentum, if you will, of a real strong spiritual Christian heritage, and I, I, there's not a day that goes by that I'm unaware of that. I'm fully aware of it, even as a young boy, and actually, well, probably until junior high, high school, that I realized that I'm in a very unique situation, because I didn't really realize that um, a lot of my friends did not have that kind of background at all, actually quite the opposite. And so, when I became aware of that, it became a very grateful And, uh, you know, the Bible talked about much is given, much is required. And so that is definitely something at the forefront of my mind and the forefront of my heart of everything we do. So I'm aware of a very unique opportunity and a unique position that I'm in to have such a strong Christian heritage. And so I wanted to write this book for, um, and we were sitting there talking about this, the idea, I forget who brought it up, but someone said, why don't you and your dad both do the book together? And I said, that'd be brilliant. I mean, coming from two different perspectives uh, in regards to inheritance. But I want to talk about something because sometimes when I, when I share that, some people think, well, I don't have a dad or a mom or I'm first generation Christian. And this book is, is, is really doesn't just address the biological inheritance. It actually, my, my ultimate dream with this book is that it would make all of us aware of the spiritual momentum that had been building ever since God started everything. And it's important to realize that because in the Old Testament, who your biological father was was really a big deal. I mean, that was your identity. Your dad was your identity. But everything changed when Jesus died on the cross. It didn't, it didn't um, demote that. It didn't weaken it. Jesus just added a whole other dimension to it. And, it's, and, it, and what matters was, is he your daddy? If he's your daddy, that's the greatest inheritance of all, the greatest momentum of all. And every, I'm not going to teach on it here at all because I don't need to. It's in here. But um, every time I've taught on spiritual inheritance and momentum, without fail, anywhere in the world, without fail, I have at least, bless you, I'll have at least one person come up to me and say, well, I don't have a family like yours. I'm first generation. And I say, that's perfect. And I look them in the eye and say, do you realize you have an opportunity that I will never have? You're actually in a position, you have an opportunity, you get to do something that I was never able to do. That's not my assignment. My assignment is to inherit and to increase it. Your assignment is to start something. It's to actually start something and to shift your entire inheritance in a different direction. And say, can you imagine right now, I do this to every person that tells me, I don't have a family like yours. And I go through this whole spiel. I say, can you imagine right now, that person six generations ago on my dad's side, four generations ago on my mom's side, they're in heaven right now saying, oh my goodness, that decision I made to follow Jesus, look what it's doing right now on the earth. <laughs> their, their bank account is just getting flooded with more riches than they could ever imagine. So I want to challenge you, if you, didn't, if you are first generation Christian, you, are, you have a unique, beautiful opportunity to start something. And I just want to encourage you with that. So this book really deals a lot with spiritual inheritance and why we tend to look at revival with an end in mind. It's amazing how many, it's amazing how many believers actually look at a move of God and they're already planning for when it to end. And it's really, it's, a, it's, a, it's a un non-kingdom mindset. Anyway, that, this book is full of that. Did someone stand up a second ago? Yeah, I want to give it to you because you stood up. No one else stood up, so I, I was waiting. So congratulations. So, uh, last one. Um, this one, I do want to give this to the person that traveled the farthest. So somehow we're going to find that out. All right? So I'll, and it can't be John. Um, this one is Christ in you. Uh, this one I wrote a couple years ago now is why God trusts you more than you trust yourself. And uh, my heart with this book is one of the most, most calm, well-known verses in Scripture, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And it's amazing how much of the church looks at that verse as their ticket to heaven. It is, but it's also much more than that. And my heart was to explore what does it actually mean to have Christ live in you. And we often don't realize how much God actually trusts us. He actually trusts us way more than you trust yourself. How do you know that? Well, why would he put Jesus in you if he didn't trust you? 
Anyway, that's, there's a lot more going on in this verse, and I want to, in, uh, in verse, verse, this is not a verse, this is the book. Um, so who traveled the farthest? Everybody's pointing right here. Where from? Where? New Zealand. Yeah, that is a bit of ways away. Can anybody beat New Zealand? Where? Who's farther? I don't, I don't know. Compare notes. New Zealand wind. Come on, come up here. I love New Zealand. There you go. Yeah. All right. Let me share some testimony to what, what God's been doing in our world the last, literally the last, I think, five weeks, maybe six weeks. We've had so, something really special. Obviously, a lot of miracles and healing, but this one really is, um, is special. I have, we have a, a man in our church. He's been, here for, been in our church for a little while. And um, 35 years ago, yeah, a little over 35 years ago, uh, he slept with his girlfriend and she got pregnant. They weren't saved at all. This was pre-Jesus. And um, something happened where the girlfriend and him decided to part ways and go the other direction. And from, if I remember the story correctly, it wasn't something he wanted. He felt indebted, like, I need to take care of her and my future child. And she pretty much wanted nothing to do with him. So she, they, they split, and they never saw each other again. And he, was, he heard stories and rumors about that, they gave, that she gave birth to a daughter, his daughter, but never seen her. And, and 35 years ago, this took place. And some random thing happened. Um, I know it was in the last six months. Somebody got a hold of somebody, and thank God for Facebook. You know, Facebook has a very, it, it had a very interesting side, but there's some really beautiful things about Facebook, how it's reconnecting people that haven't, haven't found each other. And this man got a Facebook message from a girl, and basically, long story, says, long story short, said, are you this person? I think you might be my dad. 35 years. He had never seen his own daughter in 35 years, always wondered where she was, who she was, where she was at. I mean, can you imagine any fathers? You know, I, I could not even fathom that. And come to find out that the daughter thought and was told that the dad wanted nothing to do with her for her entire life. When he, on the other side, had no opportunity to communicate, to, I want to take care of you. So two different narratives happening here. Well, she would, uh, somebody, um, the guy in our church, and my daughter re told me, 35 years, I've never seen her, never met her before. We've been talking on the phone for hours on end. Well, she flew out about two months ago and stayed for a couple of weeks, and she's working on getting out. So 35 years, a father and a daughter reunited. We had another situation, very cool. We had another situation where um, a, family, uh, a, a family in our church was down in Southern California. On, um, I forget why they went, but they're down there, and they're driving on a, um, a city bus through the streets of L.A., and um, the, the brother, I'll tell you why the brother in a minute, the brothers in the bus happened to look outside the bus, and they passed the, you know, they're going down the street, and, and he looks out, and he said, that's my brother, and the bus is going. The brother ran away from home 16 years ago, and no one knew where he was. And he's in L.A., looks out his window and said, that's my brother. So they got off the bus, went back and said, are you so-and-so, so-and-so? They haven't seen each other in 16 years. Another situation, so they were reunited. Another situation, 15 years, another man in our church, um, because of a previous relationship, had a son. The son is 15 or 16, somewhere around there, and hasn't been allowed to have a relationship with his son, and it's been 15 years. The circumstances have completely changed that now the son is relocating because he's still a teenager, relocating to Reading uh, to live with his dad. So we've had three very interesting circumstances happening. Obviously, it's God in the midst of it. In the last five or six weeks, these families have been reunited. And there's actually some other ones that have not that long, but 35 years, 16 years, and 15 years. So what I want to do right now, I, I wonder if there's anyone in this room, you've been estranged or disconnected from family members for any length of time. I, want to, I feel like the Lord's going to break through for people. I feel like the Lord's going to restore families and reconcile families tonight. And so if that makes sense to anyone, I want you to stand up. If you have family, family members, 
You can go, it could be an eighth cousin for all I care. <laughs> Honestly, if that's you, I want you to stand up. We're going to pray over you, and we're going to declare that in the next 24, 48 hours that you get text messages, Facebook, somehow you run into family members. So if you're standing and you're sitting by someone that's standing, get your hands on them. And if you're not by someone, go for it. Go, go attack somebody. If you are standing because of this, I want you to put your hand up. We want to make sure we see you. Okay, we have a couple right in the middle here. Make sure. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we are so grateful for the testimony of 35 years, 16 years, and 15 years. And we just release that testimony over each of the ones that are standing right now. That each of the ones that are standing right now, we declare breakthrough, we declare reconciliation, whatever the pain, the hurt, the longevity, the discouragement, the hopelessness, just all of the stuff that's surrounding this situation. Tonight, it will be lifted off in Jesus' name. It will be lifted off. There will be faith, hope, and love would be released into each person that's standing. And we just declare in the next 24, 48 hours that text messages, phone calls, Facebook messages, random reconnection would take place in 24, 48 hours. So we declare that now. We call to the north, to the south, to the east, and to the west come home. It's time to come home. Say that with me. Come home. For those of you that are standing up, you need to yell this with me. Come home. One more time. Come home. So we release that now in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Jesus, ahead of time for what's about to take place. Amen. 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 Is Thomas and Maria, where are you guys at? Thomas and Maria. These are my dear friends from Iceland. These, Iceland. We need to pray for Iceland right now. We need, we, Iceland needs Jesus. Would you guys stand up? This is Thomas and Maria. If you don't know them, make sure you hug them. They're dear friends of ours. Is Catherine here? Catherine, good to see you. Why don't you stand up too? I want to pray for all three of you. This is the same family, came to our church and school of ministry and planted a church back in Iceland. And so let's extend a hand to these three. And um, they live in one of the most atheistic countries in the world. And um, I think it's a divine setup. It is a divine setup for God to show up. Because we know for some people, they have to go to the absolute end of their road before they find Jesus or before Jesus finds them. So I pray for Iceland right now. God, we know that you've called that nation to be your nation. We know that you are their God and you are their Savior. And I pray right now for Iceland, we cover that nation and we say, wake up. We say, wake up. We say, Iceland, come home. We speak over that nation, come home. And I pray for this family right here. We'll continue to be a, a pivotal catalyst for that nation to come to Jesus. And I pray for signs and wonders to increase. I pray for signs and wonders and miracles to increase amongst their midst as they're walking down the street, in the stores, in the malls, and that people would have encounters with you. You know, everybody said? Amen. Amen. I love you guys. Good to see you. If you have your Bible, get it open to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. <clears throat> Anybody hungry? Yeah. Ten of you, okay. That's all I need. All I need is ten. The rest of you, I hope you're, I hope you're hungry too. Philippians chapter 3. Just have your finger there. I want to I talk, obviously, a little bit tonight, and then I'll ask you want to kind of lead into tomorrow night, at least at this point. That's my plan. If something changes, something changes. But I, I do have a goal. I do have a place I want to get to by the end of tomorrow night. That's my last time, my last session speaking. And um, I want to I wanna talk a little bit about, I know I'm, we're in a room right now of many pastors and leaders 
from within the church, outside the church. And so I want to talk to leaders. I want to talk to leaders tonight and tomorrow. And I want to challenge you. I want to provoke you. I want to, I want to get you to um, potentially think outside the box. Um, if at minimum, I'd love to make you aware of something that I believe is really important and essential for where we are and where we are going as the body of Christ. Whether it's this movement, it doesn't matter what movement it is, I just, where the Lord taking the church right now, I believe we live in the greatest time in history. I believe that wholeheartedly. That is not a prophetic I hope statement. It is an actual true reality statement. We live in one of the most unique times in human history, and I believe it's one of the most beautiful times in human history. Even in the midst of the confusion, the crisis, tragedies, all the stuff that we hear about, even in the midst of that, I said, no, this is one of the greatest times in human history. More people are getting saved in a day's time than any other time in human history. People say that people are getting saved faster than the rate of people being born. And so we live in a very unique time in human history. So I want to, I, whatever your current situation is, wherever your current status is as a leader, what you're experiencing, my challenge to you is for the next few days is to rise above your situation and get a view, get a bigger view of what God is doing. And so I want to encourage you, if, if you came in here tired, discouraged, exhausted, not sure what to do, just, just turn that off for right now, however best you can. And I, I want to, on my heart, I know for every leader, I know for the leadership here, is to get us to come up and get a bigger perspective of what the Lord is doing. Because right now is the greatest time in human history. And I'm so excited to just even say that comment, because not everybody can say that before. And so we just live in a beautiful time in human history. So I want to lay a little bit of a foundation tonight, and it's not by any means only to set up tomorrow night. They both, they both will have its own point, but I do have a goal I want to get to tomorrow night. And I realize we're talking to pastors and leaders. I want to propel you on a move you forward. So let's talk, let's read a couple of verses to kind of set kind of the, the, the heart of what I want to go after tonight and tomorrow. The to Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on. Say that with me. But I press on that I may lay a hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid a hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the pride of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. That passage obviously sits in a, in a larger context of a letter Paul is writing to, um, I, Philippians is actually, I say this about every book in the Bible, but it's one of my favorite books. And um, it really is. I, and I know it's kind of funny to say. The reason why I like Philippians, apart from the rest of Paul's books, is this is the book you can tell Paul's relationship with this church is, is very deep. It's very, um, it's very genuine. Not that his relationship with the other churches were not. The other churches that he wrote letters to with more of um, instruction, correction, encouragement, edifying. But what's different about Philippians, there's actually not a lot of flow and there's not a lot of direction within the letter. Have you ever noticed you can tell you're really good friends with someone that you can have a 10 minute conversation with them and there's no structure or point to the conversation? You can talk for 10 minutes, and you can talk about 20 things, and you didn't even finish thoughts. You didn't even finish phrases. And at the end of the 10 minutes, you're like, that was the best conversation I've ever had. How many know what I'm talking about? Why? Because there's a deep connection. It's real. You pick up where you left off. It's spontaneous. It doesn't need structure. It doesn't need any formality. Hi, my name is Eric. What's your name? Where are you from? It doesn't need that. You don't do that with close friends. It just pick up where you left off. It's spontaneous in nature, and you're just, you're just the happiest thing around. Why? Because that, that, that is a symptom of a deep relationship. And the book of Philippians has that nature about it, had that feel about it. It's just random and kind of all over the map, not in a distracting way, but it is in a very, you could tell, oh, Paul had a genuine, deep relationship with this church because it's different than in other letters. 
And so within that context, he put something in there. He's, he's almost telling them this thing, I press on towards the goal. I am laying a hold of. Tonight, what I want to talk about is new territories. New territories. Movement is really important. Movement is, 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 is more essential than we realize. There's actually three things I'm going to try to go through tonight. If you're note takers, I'm going to help you out early on. You can, this will help for those of you that like things in order. First one is Jesus is movement. Second one is movement is essential. And the third one is movement is new territories. I'll read it again. Jesus is movement. Movement is essential. And movement is new territories. Those are three things I want to try to cover tonight. Jesus is movement. How many realize that when you said yes to Jesus, you haven't stopped moving since then? I mean, it, it, it is not like you entered a safe realm. You entered into a little bit of an insane, psychotic reality of like, I didn't realize what I was signing up for. Everything I had planned in life did not turn out the way I had planned. But yet none of us were traded in for anything else. You see, saying yes to Jesus is movement itself. This is why Paul talked about with unveiled faith, we are being transformed from glory to glory. What we know that as the believer, there is only one direction for the believer. It's from glory to glory. There is no other direction. So when you say yes to Jesus, you don't go backwards. You don't go sideways. You only go from glory to glory. Now you're like, you don't know my life. No, I'm telling you right now, you're just in between the glory and glory. You're in what Bishop Gardington said, the hallway. Hell is in the hallway. But the point is you're still moving. You might not like the movement, but it's, you're still moving. The only, I don't even know the right language, but the only requirement isn't even the right word. But let me just give me grace when I say that because I know that we're not... We can't earn anything. I understand that. But there is only one requirement for moving from glory to glory is when you say yes to Jesus. That's it. There is nothing else. What's the point? There's nothing else we have to do to say yes to moving from glory to glory. The moment you said yes to him, you signed up for movement from glory to glory. There is no other option. It doesn't happen to the believer. You might feel like you're going backward, but somehow in the end you'll realize, oh, that's from glory to glory. How many realize God is not a linear God? He's not linear. Some of you wish he was. You wish God was a little bit more systematic and methodical about how he plans out and does your life. And some of us, we don't know how to grasp God, myself included. We don't know how to grasp him because we think in linear context. A, B, C, D. In order to get to Z, it has to look like this. We have to understand now, can God be linear? Can he operate in a linear context of a straight line or at least a general, might be wavy here and there, but at least we, we can see it where we're going. Of course God can. And has he? Yes, he has. I think we can all look at our life and say, oh yeah, this A, B, C, that was totally God. I'm so thankful because I, I actually knew B was coming. I knew C was around the corner and I knew D was coming. But let's be really honest. God is not a linear God. He is multidimensional. We don't even have language in any language ever known to man to accurately depict and describe how multidimensional God is. Paul worked hard in the Bible to try to, he's all manifold wisdom. That's all he could come up with. Which means multifaceted intelligence of God. What's the point? God is multidimensional. Did you notice that when your mom and dad got together and had some action and you were formed, you were created, when things begin to take place, how many notice, and we know this now because technology shows us that it wasn't like a toe appeared in your mommy's womb. And it wasn't like a toe formed into a foot. And then it wasn't like the ankle showed up. Oh, there's another foot floating around in the room. Oh, the legs are forming. And then, they, no, no, we don't, we don't even get formed linearly. But yet we try to, we try to flatten a multidimensional God. No, you formed. And once the heart is formed, they say the heart is the first fully functioning organ in the womb. Once the heart is formed, then everything grows in every direction from that point on. 
What my point is you might not think you're going in the glory to glory, but you are. Why? Because you said yes to him. Okay. Some of you really need to hear this because you're like, my life has not been a glory to glory progression. It has been anti-glory to anti-glory to even more unglory. I mean, we've got all these the beliefs and thoughts. I'm telling you, it is a lie. The moment you say yes to Jesus, it's movement from glory to glory. This is how he works. Now, the only thing I can find in Scripture is when we blatantly refuse God, then, then your movement changes. You're not necessarily going from glory to glory. But I have a feeling you didn't come all the way here because you blatantly refused God. I mean, if you did, wow, that's impressive. I'm really impressed. Maybe, I don't know. I didn't mean to be sarcastic, but that would be impressive. What's my point? Jesus is movement. When you say yes to Jesus, you're moving. You're never going to stop. It is going to continue. And when we get comfortable, guess what Jesus said? Time to pack up. We're moving on. And you're like, I don't want to move on. Well, too bad. You need to move on. And often, I, I'm going to get here. I'm going to, I might dabble in tomorrow night already. So just, it's just going to be one big conversation. New territory is the nature of Jesus. It, it is the nature of the kingdom to conquer more territory. Now, in the old covenant, it was about fighting. It was about war. It was about conquering. We don't do that anymore. But we still need to conquer territory. Whether it's personal or whether it's over culture, over nation, there's still a sense of new territories. So we have to understand, when you say yes to Jesus, there is movement. It, it, if you're not moving, it's not healthy. So movement is essential. It's so essential. We have a family friend, this was about, oh, I don't know, four or five years ago, uh, ended up in the hospital, and she is elderly. And something was going on in her body that she was in extreme pain and parts of her body were shutting down. It was actually quite scary. And death was not that far away, to be honest with you. It wasn't right here, but it was like if something doesn't change, death is, is going to meet her. And it was, uh, it was just was a scary situation. And so they called us all in. We're all engaged and, and the family getting in there. And so they do what all doctors do, at least in this situation. Because her pain level was so high, they actually injected her with tons of pain medication to help her to, you know, be comfortable on some level. And this woman in particular, she is a feisty woman. She, is, she, um, she has no filter. Like what she thinks, she tells you. And if I were to repeat some of the stuff today, it would offend you. And so I'm saying she, but, but she's one of the most godly women I've ever met in my life. And she's no filter. She's raw. She's blunt. She's honest. And she comes from a rich line of Christian heritage. And here she is. I, we know her. She's very feisty. And when, when something bothers her, she doesn't have that. I'm just going to keep that to myself. She has this <laughs> compulsion to tell everyone. I don't like that. And she'll bluntly tell you, I don't like your haircut. You shouldn't have gotten a haircut. I mean, it, it just, it's blunt. That's just who she is. And so here she is in a hospital bed. We all know her on that level. And here she is in a hospital bed, literally in tremendous pain, but no, there was, her fight was gone. Her feistiness was numbed. I mean, her, her tenacity, audacity to fight was just not there. Why? Because she's under the influence of pain medication to help her be at comfort. So several days go by, and we begin to realize her will to fight was gone. And when your will to fight is gone, especially at her age, her body was beginning to shut down. And so the family got together and said, listen, this isn't good. We've got to, this is not going in the way we want it to go. And so the family got together and said, we want the doctors to reduce the pain medication." Like, take, I forget how much they said, can you at least take this much off? And the doctor talked back and forth. And the reasoning was because she had no will to fight. It was all suppressed under the medication. And so they said, let's reduce her pain medication and let's see what happens. So they reduced her pain medication. And guess who showed up? <laughs> the woman we all knew. The woman that we knew would not be happy. But what happened? Her will to fight, her feistiness came back, and she was basically, if I can paraphrase it, her will to defeat what was going on in her body was right there. 
And so her fight came back, medication was reduced, and now her body is, they, they were, they were test, doing all kinds of testing, and they're trying to figure out what was going on. But guess what happened? I forget within, I think it was within a week, she's out of the hospital. And that was like four or five years ago. But here's the crazy part. It's because she hadn't moved, literally, yeah, I think it was a week or a week and a half. I'm, my timeline's a little off. But she hadn't moved at all. She was completely in bed, was starting to get bed sores. And when we reduced the medication, she now had some, I, she wanted to move. But she couldn't. Why? Because her muscles had atrophied. And so I remember my friend who worked in a third level of the hospital, he worked specifically, he's a physical therapist that worked with people that are dying, that are, have extreme illnesses, that are at the end of their life. And he's able sometimes to re postpone that death. So I called him, he's a friend of mine, I said, listen, I've got this situation, and I told him everything I just told you. And he said, I'll check her out by the end of the day. And this is when they reduced the pain meds, her fight came back. And so I called him up. He said, I'll, I'll check her out um, by the end of the day, and I'll give you a call. So I think it was that night or the next morning, I get a phone call from him. And he said, hey, I went and saw so-and-so. And, -so, and um, I, uh, he, he, he said, basically, man, that woman's feisty. <laughs> <laughs> that's, why, that's what we want. We want that right there. And she said, Eric, I had to spend an hour and a half just to get her out of bed. I took an hour and a half just to get her to sit up, rotate to the edge of her bed, and to get on her feet because her muscles and her body had atrophied to the point that she couldn't move anymore. She had the will but physically was not able to. And so she's in even more pain because the pain meds are reduced, but now her body is, is atrophied. And I had to basically force her to walk down the hallway. I had to force her to move. And that's what he said. And she had some very select words for me in those moments because she's feisty. And I said, but I got her to walk down. The, I think it was like 20 feet, something, I mean, something very short. I got her to walk 20 feet and then got her back in bed. And he said, I'm going to be going back every day and I'm going to be making her get out of bed. Now at four or five years ago, what's the point? If you don't keep moving, you begin to atrophy. And sometimes it's leader, whether it's discouragement or non unfulfilled expectation, we actually just kind of sit still and we no longer move forward. We no longer have a desire to conquer new territory. We no longer wake up in the morning with a reason to wake up. We just kind of hit cruise control. And it's one of the most dangerous things as leaders is to do that right there. Because the moment you stop actually having a reason to get up in the morning, you begin to, if you allow me, to spiritually atrophy. And then it becomes even harder to climb out of the hole. Movement is so essential. Why do you think God kept the nation of Israel wandering around the same mountain for 40 years in the wilderness? Have you ever thought about that? Why didn't they just camp out in one spot for 40 years and wait? They would have died. It wouldn't have worked. God kept them moving in their worst season because he knows you have to keep moving. Movement is essential. This is what nation of Israel, I did the math on it. And if I remember my math correctly, it is the longest, slowest walk in human history. It should have taken maybe two weeks to get from Egypt to the promised land. And that's like a conservative pace. Instead, it took 40 years. And if I did my math correctly, they averaged about 100 to 150 feet per day. I don't know how many meters that is. 40 meters a day. That's what they averaged for 40 years. Imagine that. That's not very fun. Now, I understand they didn't move 40 meters every day. But the point is, that distance shouldn't have taken 40 years. Now, we know the reason why they weren't allowed to go in the promised land, but my point is this. God kept them moving. He kept them getting up and packing up and moving on. Weren't we just here three years ago? Yep, we were. <laughs> yep, I went. Yep, that's where that happened. I've seen that bush. Man, that bush is bigger. I mean, those are the conversations. I've been here before. How many have ever felt that in life? I've been here before. You should actually be encouraged on some level. I mean, you don't want that to be the rest of your life, but you should be somewhat encouraged. Why? Because you're moving. 
You're actually doing something. It may feel unproductive. It may feel pointless, but you have to keep moving. I don't feel like reading my Bible today. Do it anyways. This is where, this is where you just kind of hunker down to I'm doing it no matter what. Movement is essential. You have to keep moving. They say elite athletes. We're talking about elite athletes. They say if they stop working out and training within two to three weeks, they lose a decent percentage of their muscle mass. <laughs> Isn't that interesting, though? It was a really funny comment up front if you did not hear. Isn't that interesting that you can be at the top of your game and you stop for a few weeks and you've already lost a lot? They say they actually lose more muscle mass than someone that doesn't actually do much physically. So this is, I think, if I, if I can elaborate just, just because I think it's worth mentioning, this is why I think some of our top leaders, when they have a, a situation come out and they stop moving forward, sometimes their fall is so great. Why? Because they're elite if I can use that language without sounding arrogant. King David, top of his game. I mean, the top of his game. And one day he said, I'm not going to go to work today. And that began one of the greatest falls. What's the point? You have to keep moving. I don't feel like moving. I know. You feel, well, you're going to regret it later if you don't. Now, somebody like, I feel like I'm on a hamster in a wheel. I'm just like running. Well, at least you're moving. Some of you don't want to hear this, I know. You're like, I am enjoying, that's why it's like, aww. I'm enjoying doing nothing right now. That's the problem right there. Do you see that? That's the problem right there. And if I can be honest with you, I think all of us have been at that point at least once in our life by now. Like, I don't feel like doing anything right now. I've lost vision, I've lost hope. I don't even know why I get up in the morning. Except for the alarm clock woke me up, whatever. But here's the deal. You have to keep moving. Movement is essential. It's actually, you actually will die if you don't. <clears throat> when the church stops moving forward, the past becomes our destination. You say that again. When the church stops moving forward, all we try to do is recreate what we used to have. This is one of the challenges for the church right now. All of us. No one's excused from this one. It's sometimes when we, we camp out for too long and we don't actually go, okay, where are we going? Now, you might be someone in this room that, that's like, I'm not actually, I don't actually see down the road. And I don't think everyone has the ability to. And I, and I wouldn't expect everyone to have the ability to. Just make sure you're in a community that has the ability to. I mean, I got people on my staff, some of my people I work closely with. They say, Eric, I do not have the ability to see five, ten years down the road. But once you paint the picture, I'm all in. And I love it because they very honestly recognize I, I can't see that far. I can't even see, you know, I can't see down the road. But they're in a group of people, in a community of people that can. And it's that what's healthy. So if you don't have the ability, this isn't a shortfall. This isn't a, this isn't a disability. It had nothing to do with that. Some people have the ability to see farther, and some people are really good at the moment. It's a beautiful thing. God set it up perfectly. So we actually need all of us together to figure this one out. And so sometimes in churches, as, as community believers, if we're not actually pressing forward, then if we, don't, if we don't press forward, then what we end up trying to do is trying to recreate the past. Well, it used to be this way, so let's just try to recreate that. It's an interesting dynamic, uh, and I understand that. Uh, being a leader in a church, and, and I understand these dynamics. You know, you're leaning forward, and let's say years go by, are we actually going anywhere? And all that. I want to just, let's just kind of do what we used to have. Let's just kind of recreate it. Let's, here's the formula, and here's the, the manual. Here's, the, here's the, the teaching. Here's the tapes. Here's the VHS. Or, I mean, we... we I'm not being sarcastic. I'm just being real with you. We begin to go, and listen, it's one, of, it's one of the temptations of the leader to just try to recreate where we've been and not actually try to lean into where God's taking us. So I want to challenge you, leader. There's new territories. There's a culture out there that has more gaps in culture today than ever before. And yet we're trying to recreate the past. 
And yet there's people out there that have never heard the name Jesus. There's culture out there right now that had no concept of a God. And yet we're trying to recreate the past. I'm telling you, there's plenty of territory. There's plenty of territory right now that is unchartered. There's culture right now that is unchartered. You know, we have a saying back home, and I'm going to steal this from one of my close friends who's the senior pastor of another church in Reading. And he says, Eric, our goal isn't to gather everyone under one roof. Our goal is to gather everyone under one father. There's new territories, and you are designed and positioned to conquer that new territory. And some of you tonight, this is just a message of, hey, listen, you've got to make some things right, and you've got to get back into that spot of why you have, why you waking up in the morning. You guys still alive? Okay. All right. I'm going to, I might, I might uh, lose some of you on this part, so just bear with me. You know, when you pull up Netflix or Hulu or Amazon Prime or uh, I don't know what, you, you guys have Netflix up here. I found out last night, praise God. I'm in the middle of a show right now. I was like, oh, good, it's available in Canada. <laughs> I was in the UK last summer. I was like, dang it, they don't have my show. It's horrible. I couldn't live four days without my show. But anyway, so you have Netflix. Now on Netflix, you, you can find a genre of a movie. There's a genre that's not available on Netflix, Hulu, or any. It's called Stupid Movies. There should be one, to be honest with you, and we should have the ability to say, yeah, that one belongs in that genre. Well, there, we all know there's a lot of stupid movies out there, and we all know that there's a one, there's 99.99% of all stupid movies remain stupid. But there's often a movie that, like, jumps out of that genre and becomes probably one of the best movies you've ever seen. If some of you are thinking right now, oh, yeah, I know what one they're talking about. Well, the movie I want to make reference to tonight is Nacho Libre. The other one that I actually really want to talk about is Napoleon Dynamite. Now, I apologize if that movie bothers you, if you find it offensive that I would even say that publicly. I actually don't do this very often because I can get in a lot of trouble. But I stand today to say Napoleon Dynamite was the stupidest movie ever made until the second time I watched it. And by the 10th time, it is just the best movie you've ever seen. Now, don't go watch it and then judge me, okay? Just don't do that. So in the movie Napoleon Dynamite, there's this character this character hasn't quite moved on in life. He, he's stuck in a certain era. He's stuck in this era in his life. The whole movie is actually. But there's one character. Did I lose some of you on this? You guys? Okay. He's stuck in this, this season of his life, and he hasn't moved on. Like, he keeps referencing, like, what it used to be like. If this would have happened. I mean, that's the character throughout the movie. And this character's name is Uncle Rico. Now, Uncle Rico is an uncle of Napoleon Dynamite. And Uncle Rico, there's a moment in the movie where he's sitting on the front porch with Napoleon and I forget who else. And they're sitting there and it's stupid. It's such a dumb movie. I'm like, anyway, it's just dumb. I shared this at Bethel and that afternoon after church, I had people got together in house parties and watched the movie and sent me pictures. I'm like, oh no, this is not good. But in the, there's a scene where Uncle Rico says something like this, man, if the coach would have put me in the game. And he's 30-something, and he's talking about when he was 18. Man, if the coach would have put me in the game, we would have won state championship. And I'd be an NFL quarterback, and I'd be a millionaire. And he's just talking like that. So in my house, my wife and I had this joke. We had this thing. Whenever we talk about what it used to be like, we look at each other and say, don't be like Uncle Rico. <laughs> and so I want to tell you right now as leaders, whether you've seen the movie or not, don't be like Uncle Rico. Wow. Don't talk about, man, if this would have happened, my life would be like this right now. We are designed to conquer new territories. It is in our blood it is in our DNA 
This is why Jesus was constantly on the move. Jesus would constantly wake you up. Hey, guys, we got to go over here. Hey, guys, we need to go over here. Jesus, we're exhausted. Okay, let's go on a vacation. And on the way to their vacation, they get interrupted by multitudes. There was constant movement around Jesus. And you think, I'm exhausted. Well, Jesus was able to do it and thrive. And he actually lives inside of us. Then there's a way to keep moving and not be worn out, burned out, etc. There's actually a way to do it. And I want to challenge you. Some of you are actually here tonight because you're burnt out. You've, you've burned every candle you can think of. Well, the Lord wants to refresh you the next few days. He actually wants to encounter you, whack you, rock you, and all the other words that we use. And he wants to give you vision. Some of you had dreams that are not fulfilled. Those are the new territories. Those are the territories that you need to bring back and put it in front of you. Say, God, you promised me this, and that's why I'm getting up in the morning because of this new territory. Okay. Third area. I've already kind of championed it, but I'll just phrase it. Movement is new territory. Written in our code, when we met Jesus, this is who we are. If you were to take... I believe there are, there might be more, and this isn't meant to be doctrinal by any means or theological by any means. It's just more of a a generalized statement that helps me to kind of have a framework. When I met, when we meet Jesus, there seem to be three major emphases, apart from the fact that you're saved by grace and and all all that. I I don't need, but something happened as a result of meeting Jesus. The first thing is you long for something you've never longed for before. You have this longing for the Father. You're like, one moment you didn't even know he existed, and you said yes to him, and all of a sudden the deep called unto deep. You have a longing for the Father. This is why Abba, Father, Daddy, all the, so we have all these words. They're like, God, I want more of you. This is why a majority of our worship songs are like, God, I want more of you. That is a normal, not humanistic response. It is a normal spiritual response to when you find out he's real, you're like, I want more of that. It's normal. It's a longing for the Father. The second area is you have this incredible desire to serve humanity. It's like you woke up and go, I know why I'm alive. I'm actually supposed to help. I'm actually supposed to contribute to society. I'm supposed to contribute and bring the kingdom into every situation. I'm to bring light into darkness. So this desire to serve humanity just goes up a whole nother level. And the third area is there's this intriguing, and this is biblical, but this intriguing one is you have a desire to rebuild cities. Most of the Old Testament is actually designed around rebuilding cities. A lot of it is. Which is interesting, if you take another conversation, you have power and wisdom in Scripture. New Testament, New Covenant is a massive demonstration of power. Jesus would, he demonstrated power, signs and wonders, miracles, crazy, crazy stuff. But if you study the Old, Old Testament, the Old Covenant, if you will, is there power there? Of course. Look at Elijah. Enough said. But there's something else, a massive strand throughout the Old Testament, and it has to do with the word wisdom. Now, the issue with wisdom for us right now is most people's definition, understanding, concept of wisdom is good advice. Wisdom is good advice. It is, but it's much more than that. Proverbs talked about it. Exodus talked about it. Genesis even, I mean, it's loaded. Where wisdom said, I was there when he created the heavens and the earth. When he said, let there be light, I was there. I formed the deep under the deep. I formed the water. I made sure it actually worked. So wisdom is not just good advice. Wisdom had the ability to take something that meant nothing or is nothing and make it of value. And I don't have time to get into that, but my point is simply this. When you, I feel like what the Lord's doing in the body of Christ right now, he's taking, if I can use a spectrum, you have people that emphasize power, and you say the other end of the spectrum emphasize wisdom. I feel like the Lord's merging those two in the same body of believers versus oh, that church represents power and that church represents wisdom. One of my visions for Bethel is that we be a house, we be a body of believers, a community of believers that walk in power and in wisdom. Some of you need to hear this right now. Jesus demonstrated both. 
Could certain situations call for power and other situations call for wisdom? <clears throat> so here we are, movement in new territories. Somewhere in the, um, tomorrow I'm going to talk a little bit about different eras in human history, uh, and, and I'll, I'll go with there, but I want to do a little bit tonight. Culture, church and culture. Whenever we talk about church and culture, it, it's intriguing. It's intriguing because whenever church and culture get in the same room, a fight usually breaks out. You know, it's like, you know, you know, you know there's, just this, there's just tension. It, it, it reveals something that's tragic. It reveals something that, how do we get here? What it reveals to me is that we actually have lost our place within culture, so now we're just trying to find out how to get re-engaged with culture. You see, there is a time in human history, especially in the early church, you see, the early church actually defined culture. There's actually periodic periods of time within human history that the church was actually creating the culture that the world lived in. And so here we are, you know, you back up to, you know, you back up to early 1900, a rough time frame. You have something that happened which is called suburbia, suburban. And people got exhausted of urban centers, got exhausted of inner city, they got exhausted at the quick expansion, the industrial revolution, all these things begin to kick into play and, and people got worn out living in cities. Now we all know that today that the cities, urban centers, much like Toronto, it actually, they are responsible to shape culture. Much of culture across the nation is actually defined within a dense population of people, which we would call metropolises or large cities, urban centers. Those urban centers actually define and create culture, whether good or bad is not the point right now, but it actually responsible. This is why, this is why in California, I uh, forget who asked me, said, you know, California, there's people in California that want to split. They want to split the state in two, which I'm not a fan of, but that's another conversation. Now, why do they want to split the state in two? Because San Francisco and L.A. are determining the way of life for people out for the rest of the state. Why? Because they create culture. They politically, spiritually, religiously, and all these things, and they create culture. And so as a result of this in the early 1900s, what you had is you had believers actually left urban centers, and they left the cities, and they left the centers of culture. In other words, they lost their place in culture. They forgot how to engage, and they lost their place. And so we begin to set up, and this is not a, this, this statement I'm about to make makes no reference to a specific denomination or a specific church, so just understand that. But we begin to build community churches. It's basically, let's just leave that and create our own little worlds. And in doing that, we lost our place in culture. We lost our place of influence. We lost our place to be engaged with real issues that face humanity today. So this is why it feels very much like we're on the outside trying to find a way back in. And, and if I were to be honest with you, we are making up for lost time. Now, what's happened in the last five years alone, especially the last 10 years, dramatic steps forward where the church is actually getting back into the center of these culture centers and actually having a voice to bring to the conversation. So that we're, we're in the midst of one, I believe, one of the greatest awakenings that we are, we're actually seeing it as we speak. It just looks different than what we're used to. And so we have these community churches that have formed. Like we, let's, just, let's just segregate. Let's just, let's just go and let's just create our own little worlds. Now, in doing that, now, I, I'm sure there, I wasn't alive then, so I can't tell you what it was like, and I'm, not much of us were as well. But it was probably like just exhaustion, I'm done, I just want to get out, I want a safe place for my family, safe place for my kids, et cetera, et cetera. Very good reasons. But something else began to shift, is that we became a customer-driven church instead of a Jesus Christ-driven church. You see, Jesus never retreated and hid out. He never, he, he went to a safe place, but he always left that place to re-engage with culture. And Jesus and Paul, I believe, are some of the premier examples of people that knew how to engage their culture. Have you noticed Jesus? You don't know anything between the age of 12 and the age of 30. All we know, the young boy, and we leave off these scholars tell us around 12 years old. Like, all right, 12 years old, he grew in favor with God and with man. And that's pretty much all we hear about Jesus until he reemerged around roughly the age of 30. Have you ever wondered what happened between the age 12 and 30? 
I have, and I can't wait to ask Jesus himself. I want to see every Blu-ray, DVD, HD, whatever <laughs> format it's in of what your life was like between the age of 12 and 30. I'm just fascinated by that. But I don't think it's too risky to say that he just lived a life, and he, he grew up in a culture. This is why Jesus, by the time he became 30, he's able to speak into culture with such precision because he understood it. He actually understood the thought, the framework, the mindset, the cultural momentum that people were caught up in. He said, oh, yeah, well, what about this? This is why the Pharisees were dumbfounded. They tried to trap him in the corner with some theological question, and Jesus would unravel it before their eyes. Why? Because he understood culture. Paul, Paul was brilliant at this. Paul would walk around the city for a few days and go, oh, I know what this city's all about. And then he'd stand up, and Paul's a little different. He'd stand up on the, in the synagogue and start preaching, and he was unraveling their culture and how, how false it was and how ignorant it was. This is why Paul was so good at this is because he understood culture. He understood how people thought, how cities thought. He understood how major cities in the ancient days, how they functioned. Are you guys following me? If I could do anything, it's to inspire you to not be scared of the society and culture that we are in right now. And we have too many people that are still scared. Like, they just need to come into my building and then I'll help them. No, no, no. They're begging for you to come to them. We're going to unpack some more tomorrow night. But I just want to inspire you. Something happened when the church became a community Driven, customer service driven. So instead of coming to church to get prodded, to move, we became, now I want you to satisfy me. And we became a customer driven church. We became a place where we got upset if we didn't get a parking spot. Someone sitting in my seat. That didn't happen here either. I know it never happens here. Never. Never happened to Bethel either. One Sunday, I'm like, all right, everybody get up, find another seat. I can't wait to do that. I'm waiting for the perfect moment. Well, I don't want to move. No, move. You need to move. That's for another time. So we became customer service. We walked. Something happened. It's amazing how much we forget the Sermon on the Mount from the parking lot to in the church building and out back out of the parking lot. It's amazing. We forget the Sermon on the Mount. We forget how to actually, it's actually not about me. And we've changed from a theology to a meology. We have. We, we've made the gospel a meology. We've made it about me. I saw a great quote the other day. It said, you didn't give your life to Jesus. He gave his life to you. It's like, that's a great point. That's a really good point. And so for some of us, I'm myself included, we were, we, at some ways, we're, we're at, it's not our fault because we just kind of came on the occasion, but I want to challenge you. Our theology has now become a meology, so our worship songs are more about me than about the Creator. Our teachings are more about what can I get out of it instead of what can I give. And so we have people, this is, this, this is a big deal. We have, a me, we have a meology where Jesus died for me. Yes, He did. And we also have a meology around holiness. We think holiness... Is for me. It never is about you. Holiness is actually means unto another. It's about Jesus. It got quiet in here. And so we've got this progression. We've got to like stop this momentum in place and say, all right, we've got to change the game. My wife and I, we have made it our life's goal to raise our children to not be scared of culture. There's some risk in that. Because what do you do? You, you let them be exposed to what's going on. I'm going to be careful here. So I want to, I probably should, I've gone late. Do I need to end? I'm okay? Okay. I grew up in a Christian school. My parents sent me to Christian school, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. Loved it. It instilled in me some beautiful things. It, it, it was awesome. And this is not a commentary. I just want to get you to think just a little, okay, if I can do anything. I love going to a Christian school. In fact, I put my children in Christian school for a few years. But we didn't keep them there the entire time. And it's not because of anything against a Christian school at all. It had nothing to do with that. It was like, 
I need my children to be exposed to unsafe places. Now, am I putting them in situations where they fail? No. It just requires more parenting, if I can just say, be honest with you. It just requires me to do my job a whole lot better. Now, am I throwing my children out to the wolves and, hey, hope you make it? No, I'm not, it's not that ignorant. I just want to get you to think a little bit. We've got to actually change some of the processes and stuff that we do because when you are unprotect, when you are so segregated from what's going on in the world and you're thrown into it, it's a really tough transition. And so we've, we've had to explore this as parents. And it's not been easy, to be honest with you. If you ask me how to go, it's like, whoo, that, it's going. And my kids are great. They're, 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 they're doing well. But there were moments of like, oh, my gosh, what, are, what have we done? I'm just being honest with you. And thankfully, there's no massive moral falls. I mean, there's none of that. Thank God. But it's a little freaky. But I, I have, we have such this conviction that we've got to raise our children to not be scared of culture. They've actually got to learn to be within it and, and, and know who they are and to be able to be in the midst of it and be a part of the conversations. But why? Jesus was invited to the, all the parties. Isn't that interesting? Jesus, the guy, repent of your sins. And the very people he's preaching to said, hey, I got a party in my house. Do you want to come? Isn't that interesting? So I think it's safe to ask the question, are we being invited to the parties? I think it's a really good indication, potentially, that if you're in culture, people want you around. They actually want your presence. They want you to be around. You may not condone the activity of the party, but they want you to be there. And we know some of the parties Jesus went to weren't all probably Christian parties. I don't know. We don't know that for sure, but I'm just going to propose. They probably weren't Bible studies. <laughs> Are you following me? Yeah. So, Jesus, will you come to our party? What's my point? I really want to inspire you to not be so segregated from culture. It's time for the church to actually look for ways creatively to re-engage with culture to be in the conversation. This is why we're dumbfounded when all these major world issues come up because we've not been a part of any of the conversations. Now, thankfully, there are Daniels out there that kind of, you know, Daniel don't fit into any church model. <laughs> Daniels wouldn't fit in any church model. Daniel served three evil kings. In some cases, they say they're the worst kings in the Bible. And yet Daniel served them. Isn't that interesting that God would give Daniel all the ability to interpret all dreams and visions to serve a man that hated God? That doesn't make sense. Let me, let me walk that through you for a minute here. Let's say, let's say John, which he does, he's the most loving man in this room. So that's why I'm going to pick on him for a second. Let's say John didn't like me. In fact, he hated me, which isn't even possible. No one hates me. No, I'm kidding. No, because John didn't have, John had no ability to. But just for example, John, let's say John hates me. He, he despises me. He's actually setting everything up to even make that hate grow. And Duncan here, Duncan loves me. And I'm like, Duncan, I'm going to give you all the skill sets. I'm going to give you supernatural gift, not just the ability to interpret some dreams and some vision. I'm actually going to give you the ability to interpret dreams that you didn't even know they had. I'm going to give that to you so you can serve that man who hates me. Nobody in this room would do that. Who in their right mind would enable someone to help someone that hates you? So that alone, Daniel do not fit into the box. They don't fit into the common box. Now, thankfully, what's happening, and I believe in the next five or ten years, will be some of the most fruitful years in this conversation. So I'm just doing my part to contribute to it. We're going to see in the next five or ten years, I believe, I believe the church is, our church is ready for Daniel to emerge, for the Joseph to emerge. We actually are getting set up to re-engage with culture. And I want to challenge you. 
as leaders, as pastors, as leaders in your own right, whatever you do, pray that the Lord gives you a new operating system, a new paradigm of what it looks like to conquer new territory. Because there's a lot of territory out there that have yet to see or hear or experience the goodness of God. And we all know one encounter with God changes everything. Okay, I'm going to try to wrap up. Just give me, give me just a second here to reacquaint myself. <clears throat> All right. Last comment, and then I'm, gonna, I'm just going to pray. Are you guys getting this tonight? Yes. Okay. Most of our attention as believers should be on the dividing culture, the gap between people and God, not so much on the divide within the church. We are at our best when we serve people. We, we are brilliant when we serve people. I mean, there is no other entity, if I can use that word, that kills it when they serve people. Jesus was constantly demonstrating the ability to serve. And you and I are at our best. And the moment we stop serving culture, humanity is not a great moment for us. So I want to pray that our conviction, our attention will be drawn to the gap between people and God, the divide, the chasm, more than any other gap. There's a gap in our church. The Lord will deal with that. But right now, there's a world out there that has not heard the name Jesus yet. They've not experienced the goodness of God. They have a very skewed view of a good God. I'm going to ask, please don't stand, and there's no shame if you don't stand at all, but I, I, I want to pray for people that have a sense of conviction. This is resonating in you, and you're at different places. Maybe some of you are like, wow, I've, I've actually been segregating for so long, or you haven't, and you're just like, man, I want to get more momentum in this conversation. Wherever you fit in that spectrum, I want you to stand. This is your way of saying, God, I'm all in. And again, if you, if you don't want to stand, no pressure at all. I just simply want to pray for you because I feel like the Lord is raising up another army. He's raising up people that know how to actually engage in culture, that are going to get really good at not flinching. They're going to get really good at being known for how much they love people and not so much about what's wrong and what's right. One thing my grandfather, my dad, dad, he taught us something, and I didn't realize it because I was a young boy for most of his life, obviously. And I, when I wrote the Christ in You book, I realized something. Grandpa M. Earl Johnson, the patriarch of our house, he taught us how to love people beyond our desire to protect our own reputations. And that's my prayer tonight. Father, I pray tonight, every person that's standing, we are standing right now, myself included. We want to be agents of change. We want to be people that conquer new territories. We know that when we said yes to you, there's movement that will never end. And I pray tonight, no matter where anybody's at on the spectrum, if we are the person that, you know what, I've actually been hiding, I've been segregating for so many years that I forgot there's actually a world out there. I pray tonight such compassion and love would fall on them that when they leave this place tonight, they look at humanity with a completely different lens. They actually fall in love with humanity that a moment ago they were scared of, avoided, or couldn't stand. They'd actually be so overwhelmed with love for humanity that they actually begin to thrive outside of safe contexts. And I pray for everyone else, no matter how far in that spectrum, all the way up into people that are super engaged in culture right now. I pray for supernatural wisdom and power to fall upon everyone standing right now. Everyone standing. And I pray that you, there will be, I pray, I honestly pray, God, that you release an operating system to be a download of a new operating system of what this looks like in the days to come. 
We know that the operating system that we've had, that you gave us, worked beautiful. It produced so much fruit to this moment. But we know where we're going, the new territory. There's another operating system. There's another way of doing things. And I pray that you give us a grace and a strength and courage from deep. Deep courage to charter this new territory. And I pray for an awakening to happen in the hearts and minds of people in this room tonight. And I pray for clarity. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would make anything clear that wasn't clear. And I pray that you breathe life onto every seed that was planted. And I pray for leaders of all ages, no matter if we've lost our fire, our passion, tonight we get it all back. We get it all back times 10. Because we aren't done yet. We're not, we're not done yet. We still got a lot of ground to go after. Because, God, we know that you are in the midst of what's happening on a global scale. And so I pray for an impartation of wisdom tonight to function and operate in culture like never before. Put your hand on your neighbor for a moment. If I could have everyone stand for this one. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, come, increase yourself. Increase yourself. We pray that you would mess that person up next to us really good. There'd be refreshing, recalibration, reacquaintance. That there really would be a revival that would take place in them right now. More, 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 more. Increase, increase, increase. Increase. Increase, increase. Just take another moment. Just give and receive. You can, you can do it all at once. Just give and receive. <laughs> increase, increase, increase. Increase, increase, increase. Let there be an awakening in our heart tonight. Let there be another awakening. Take us farther, take us deeper in you. God, you promised in the Bible that no eye has seen or heard. So we ask tonight, take us to those places. So more, 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 more. Increase, increase, increase. That's right. More, more, more. Just take another moment. More, 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 more. That's right. Increase, increase. That's right. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. to stay in this mode right now, but I want to ask, is there a husband and wife in this part of the room and the wife has something wrong physically with you? You need a miracle. I know that's very general. Is there a husband and wife somewhere over here? There's something wrong with the wife physically. Wave at me if that's you. Is it happen to be is it on the left side of your body by chance? No, but there's something, okay, there any, I want to make sure. I see this picture. Is that over here? Wrong side of the room then, okay. So the husband and wife, there's something wrong with the left side of your body. Who is that? Is that you? Okay, all right. Well, Holy Spirit, we say healing in Jesus' name. 
in Jesus' name. I don't know what the situation is, but we command that part of the body to be completely healed in Jesus' name. I feel like the Lord's going to give back to you everything that was taken with interest. Anything that's been taken from you on a physical level, on an emotional level, and a spiritual level, I feel the Lord's returning that back to you with interest. Everything the enemy took from you, giving it back to you and more. I also see, honestly, I feel like tonight when you go to sleep and in the next couple of days, there's going to be a fresh vision going to be given to you. You might even have a dream about it tonight, but I actually see your eyes right now, specifically on the wife. I see your eyes right now. You're going to begin to see things you've never seen before, and it's going to become your vision for the rest of your life. So there's something about new territories on you. Your eyes are going to begin to see stuff that you've never seen before. So we bless you in Jesus' name. We bless you in the name of Jesus. Did anybody have a problem with your left knee? Who is that? The left knee. Okay, who else? Right here? Okay. Right over here? Anybody else? Wave high. A couple more. Okay. Put your hand on your left knee and say, no more. No more. All right, test it out. Take a moment and just test it out right now. Somebody has a problem with your left ankle. And I think it was some type of sporting accident. Who is that? Left ankle sporting accident. Right here? Okay. Did it, did it roll really bad? Is that right? Okay. All right. I want whoever's sitting next to the, I see two people. There's someone else. Okay, over here too. Grab the people next to you. Have them put their hand directly on that ankle and take a moment and come in healing in Jesus' name. Somebody got in a car accident, I think it was at least five years ago at least five years ago, maybe seven, and the injuries haven't fully recovered. There's still some um, after effects, if you will. Who is that? Car accident, somewhere around five or seven years ago. Did that make sense to anybody? Maybe someone you... Is that you? Is that your ankle? Oh, okay. You had a car accident, and did your ankle get injured in that? Do you have other injuries as a result of that car accident? Oh, your neck, okay. All right, so we command healing to your neck in your head, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. From head to toe, restore everything. From head to toe. That's right. Okay, is there anybody that we pray for that something's changed? Is the left side of your body, I don't, is anything changed on that? Something's happening to the man in front of you. Is that your knee? How is it? Is that right? No more pain? Praise God. Anybody else with the knee? Anybody else with the knee? Just give me a few more minutes, and I'm going to get the ministry team up here. I know I've gone a little long, but just give me another moment. Is there anything changed with the left side of your body? Can you say it louder? Okay. All right, 100%. Anybody else? Anybody? How about over here with the car accident? How's your neck? She's still getting whacked. I'll let her finish that out. Okay. Is there anybody else that God done something in your ankle, your knee? Was it your, how's your knee? It's better? Is it, is it 100%? What, what would hurt? What would normally hurt? It was sore. Now, when you squat and bend, there's, how's the soreness? What's that? A little bit? Okay. All right, 100%. Is there anybody else before we close this out? Okay, praise God. Praise God. If we could have the ministry team, if you could come up to the front, and uh, we're going to transition into just more ministry time up front here. And um, if you need a miracle in your body, you want a fresh touch, you're just hungry for more, then this team up front here would love to pray for you. They want to lay hands. One thing I know about Toronto is you love to lay hands on people. You're not shy about that, and we love that. Do I need to hand the mic to somebody to? Carol, all right. I'll have Carol take over. Yeah, if you want prayer for ministry, if you want more of being just filled with God, just find yourself a green line 
and this at the back, and a few on, under the flags. And uh, we're going to have the worship team come back up and just have some worship time and soaking in his presence because you want to be really filled. So we also need catchers because it's just safer that way. Can I have somebody volunteer to come to each ministry team person? Put your hands up, ministry team, that need a catcher, and just come along and say, yes, I'll catch for you. Because you know what? The catchers get a double portion. I hate to tell you that, but that's true. Okay? So when you have a uh, catcher, then put your hand down. Okay? You want to catch for... Okay, we need some more catchers. Just link up with one of the ministry team. Come on, we need some more catchers. Anybody that's got their hand up, go, go link up with them. Okay, ministry team, spread out at the front and then go to the back. And when you have your... When you have your uh, uh, catcher, okay, and one line at the front on the toes on the on the green line. One line only. If the the front is full, then go to the back or off to the side. Back there, there's room, and back under the flags, there's room. So, Lord, let your presence come. Lord, come and fill each and every one. Lord, with your incredible fire. Yo, thank you, Lord. Shabaka. Come on. Whoa. Fire on them, Lord. Fill these pastors and leaders up, Lord. Ah. Whoa. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Yo. Sha. Come on. I need a couple of guys. Sha. Ah. More, Lord. Fill them to overflowing. Fill them to overflowing. Well, ah, woo. more on them, Lord. Increase your presence and your fire on them, Lord. Every bit of discouragement lifting off, Lord, as your incredible anointing comes on them, Lord. Fire on them, Lord. Pour it in, pour it in, pour it in, pour it in. Anybody that still needs prayer, you've got to have your toes on the line and there can't be anybody behind you. It's too dangerous. There's somebody behind you. Go back to the lines. Along the side, under the flags. Where you go. <laughs> you don't want to land on somebody. Wow. Okay, over here. Come on, catchers. Well, just line up along here, and we'll pray for you. Uh, thank you, Lord. Let your wonderful glory fall. Whoa, thank you, Lord. Show. Anybody that wants prayer? Green line. Jesus, I thank you to come and fill this precious one up. Wow, with your glory. Whoa, thank you, Lord. Fill them up, Lord. Yo! Ah! Uh, uh, nothing worth more could ever come close to thinking uh, come back. All the things Your presence Lord. You I've tasted and seen The sweetest More, Lord. of the Let your glory come Let your presence sweet. fill shame Wow By your presence, Fire, Lord. Lord. 
fire on her life. Woo-hoo. Yo. Ah. Uh. 